As my Bogosity co-host Chris Hangartner noticed, Wikipedia has Lysander Spooner categorized as a socialist, which is bizarre because he really is at least very close to being history's first true anarcho-capitalist. I was looking through the links trying to find out why, and all of their references seem to come back to this one article by Ian McSorsa, The Ideas of Lysander Spooner, Libertarian or Libertarian Socialist. And there isn't the first bit of truth to it. As usual, we see socialists behaving exactly like creationists, quote mining, denying reality, and even outright lying about Spooner and what he believed. Really, all you need to do to debunk this article is to look at what Spooner really said. So let's take a look at his first quote mine from Spooner's letter to Grover Cleveland. As usual, all links are in the description. Spooner was opposed to wage labor, wanting that social relationship destroyed by turning capital over to those who work in it, as associated producers and not as wage slaves. Hence, Spooner was anti-capitalist, preferring to see a society of self-employed farmers, artisans, and cooperating workers, not a society of wage slaves and capitalists. This can be clearly seen from the following quote. All the great establishments of every kind, now in the hands of a few proprietors, but employing a great number of wage laborers, would be broken up. For few or no persons who could hire capital and do business for themselves would consent to labor for wages for another. This shows that Spooner was opposed to capitalism, preferring an artisan system based on simple commodity production, with capitalists and wage slaves no more being replaced by self-employed workers. The thing is, a few paragraphs earlier, Spooner made it clear what he was talking about. But this needed capital your lawmakers arbitrarily forbid them to have, and for no other reason than to reduce them to the condition of servants, and subject them to all such extortions as their employers, the holders of the privileged money, may choose to practice upon them. And the entire paragraph McSorza pulled his quote from reads, the amount of money capable of being furnished by this system is so great that every man, woman, and child who is worthy of credit could get it and do business for himself or herself, either singly or in partnerships, and be under no necessity to act as a servant or sell his or her labor to others. All of the great establishments of every kind, now in the hands of a few proprietors, but employing a great number of wage laborers, would be broken up, for few or no persons who could hire capital and do business themselves would consent to labor for wages for another. Spooner is absolutely not talking about capitalism or wage slavery or anything else like that. He was talking about government placing restrictions on who can get credit. The next quote is just as bogus and pretty much for the same reason. Further highlighting his anti-capitalist ideas is this quote, where he notes that under capitalism, the laborer does not receive all the fruits of his own labor, as the capitalist lives off the worker's honest industry. Almost all, oh God, you know it's a bad sign when they start with an ellipsis. Fortunes are made out of the capital and labor of other men than those who realize them. Indeed, large fortunes could rarely be made at all by one individual, except by his sponging capital and labor from others. Thus, Spooner believed that every person was entitled to all the fruits of his own labor, and so called for the end of wage labor, i.e. capitalism, by ensuring workers owned their own means of production. Alright, here's the entire paragraph from Poverty, Its Illegal Causes and Legal Cure. This supposition illustrates fairly the operation of usury laws in depriving the mass of men of the fruits of their labor. These laws give a monopoly of the loanable capital to a few individuals. These individuals, having a monopoly of capital, are able to take advantage of the necessities of all those who have not capital of their own and are forbidden to borrow any on which to labor. They thus compel them to sell their labor at a price that will give their employer a large slice out of the products of their labor. The laws themselves are the contrivances not of the retired rich men who have capital to loan, for they, of course, wish to carry their money to the largest and freest market, but of those few enterprising businessmen, as they are called, who, in and out of legislatures, are more influential than either the rich or the poor who control the legislation of the country, and who by means of usury laws, can sponge money from those who are richer, 
and labor from those who are poorer than themselves, and thus make fortunes. And they are almost the only men who do make fortunes, for almost all fortunes are made out of the capital amid labor of other men than those who realize them. Indeed, large fortunes could rarely be made at all by one individual, except by his sponging capital and labor from others. Amid the usury laws are the means by which he does it. He is not in any way complaining about capitalism. He's complaining about usury laws. He's talking about government placing caps on interest rates, which adversely affects the poor and working class by making it more difficult for them to get loans. The lower your income, the more of a risk you are to a creditor, especially if you don't have any credit history. So these usury laws effectively prevent the poor from having access to credit. He deliberately took out that first part of the paragraph. If he'd included so much as two sentences before, it would have been obvious he was talking about usury laws because he stated so directly. This cannot be an innocent mistake. Ian McSorza is lying. His next few quotes are from other people making claims about what Spooner said, which, as we've already seen, are not to be trusted. Use the words of Lysander Spooner or none at all. So let's go further down where he quotes from No Treason. Spooner first seems to view the profit motive with considerably more skepticism than modern libertarians. Bankers, particularly the Rothschilds, evoke scathing criticism. Spooner writes... You know what? I'm just going to go ahead and give the full quote in context. I'm not going to keep reading this stuff out twice. In Europe, the nominal rulers, the emperors and kings and parliaments, are anything but the real rulers of their respective countries. They are little or nothing else than mere tools, employed by the wealthy to rob, enslave, and, if need be, murder those who have less wealth or none at all. The Rothschilds, and that class of moneylenders of whom they are the representatives and agents, men who never think of lending a shilling to their next-door neighbors, for purposes of honest industry, unless upon the most ample security and at the highest rate of interest, stand ready at all times to lend money in unlimited amounts to those robbers and murderers who call themselves governments, to be expended in shooting down those who do not submit quietly to being robbed and enslaved. McSorsa includes an ellipsis that skips three full paragraphs, making it look like they were part of the same paragraph. The last bit in context reads, And why are these men so ready to lend money for murdering their fellow men? Solely for this reason, viz. that such loans are considered better investments than loans for the purpose of honest industry. They pay higher rates of interest, and it is less trouble to look after them. This is the whole matter. The question of making these loans is, with these lenders, a mere question of pecuniary profit. They lend money to be expanded in robbing, enslaving, and murdering their fellow men solely because, on the whole, such loans pay better than any others. They are no respecters of persons, no superstitious fools, that reverence monarchs. They care no more for a king or an emperor than they do for a beggar, except that he is a better customer, and can pay them better interest for their money. If they doubt his ability to make his murder successful for maintaining his power and thus extorting money from his people in future, they dismiss him unceremoniously as they would dismiss any other hopeless bankrupt who should want to borrow money to save himself from open insolvency. He's talking about people who lend money to government. He is not in any way talking about the profit motive. I mean, if McSorza doesn't think that libertarians are critical of the Rothschilds, he hasn't spoken to many libertarians. The fact is, we are always skeptical of the profit motive and other economic incentives when governmental power is involved, and that is exactly what Spooner is talking about here. In particular, Spooner believes that sheer wealth has intrinsic power, even to such an extent as to force governments to behave at the behest of the wealthy. But as we've seen, he's not talking about the wealthy, remember? He's talking about those few enterprising businessmen, scare quotes, as they are called, who, in and out of legislatures, are more influential than either the rich or the poor who control the legislation of the country. That is who he is talking about. Context matters. All we need to see of his next quote is the first sentence. Thus, it is evident that all these men, who call themselves by the high-sounding names of emperors, kings, sovereigns, 
Yes, he's talking about government, the ruling class. He is not saying that this is the case with all wealthy people. He is talking about the subset of wealthy people who have legislative and executive power. He certainly isn't saying that these people are servants of the wealthy, as McSorza claims. For his next quote, we need to go back to the preceding paragraph. What is important to be noticed is that these so-called presidents, senators, and representatives, these pretended agents of all the people of the United States, the moment their exactions meet with any formidable resistance from any portion of the people themselves, are obliged, like their co-robbers and murderers in Europe, to fly at once to the lenders of blood money for the means to sustain their power. And they borrow their money on the same principle, and for the same purpose, viz. to be expended in shooting down all those people of the United States, their own constituents and principles, as they profess to call them, who resist the robberies and enslavements which these borrowers of the money are practicing upon them. And they expect to repay the loans, if at all, only from the proceeds of the future robberies which they anticipate it will be easy for them and their successors to perpetrate through a long series of years upon their pretended principles if they can but shoot down some hundreds of thousands of them and thus strike terror into the rest. Perhaps the facts were never made more evident in any country of the globe than in our own that these soulless blood money loan mongers are the real rulers, that they rule from the most sordid and mercenary motives, that the ostensible government, the presidents, senators, and representatives so-called, are merely their tools, and that no ideas of or regard for justice or liberty had anything to do in inducing them to lend their money for the war. In proof of all this, look at the following facts. He is not saying that the politicians are good and worthy individuals who are rendered helpless by these horrible moneylenders. He makes it plain, these lenders of blood money enable politicians to maintain the power when the people begin to resist them. And they have no reason not to borrow the money, since all they need to do to pay it back is to rob it from the people via taxation. The next quote is from just two paragraphs later, and should be read in the same context, and keep in mind that Spooner was a vehement abolitionist. Notwithstanding all this, that we had learned and known and professed for nearly a century, these lenders of blood money had, for a long series of years previous to the war, been the willing accomplices of the slaveholders in perverting the government from the purposes of liberty and justice to the greatest of crimes. They had been such accomplices for a purely pecuniary consideration, to wit, a control of the markets in the South. In other words, the privilege of holding the slaveholders themselves in industrial and commercial subjection to the manufacturers and merchants of the North who afterwards furnished the money for the war. And these northern merchants and manufacturers, these lenders of blood money, were willing to continue to be the accomplices of the slaveholders in the future for the same pecuniary considerations. But the slaveholders, either doubting the fidelity of their northern allies, or feeling themselves strong enough to keep their slaves in subjection without northern assistance, would no longer pay the price which these northern men demanded. And it was to enforce this price in the future, that is, to monopolize the southern markets, to maintain their industrial and commercial control over the South that these northern manufacturers and merchants lent some of the profits of their former monopolies for the war in order to secure to themselves the same or greater monopolies in the future. These, and not any love of liberty or justice, were the motives on which the money for the war was lent by the North. In short, the North said to the slaveholders, If you will not pay us our price, give us control of your markets for our assistance against your slaves, we will secure the same price, keep control of your markets, by helping your slaves against you, and using them as our tools for maintaining dominion over you. For the control of your markets we will have, whether the tools we use for that purpose be black or white, and be the cost in blood and money what it may. This next party actually gets right that Spooner hated militarism like all libertarians and anarcho-capitalists, and is also against coercive force itself, again like all libertarians and anarcho-capitalists. McSorsa seems to be pretending that these positions are anti-capitalist somehow. So, to make Spooner appear to be a socialist, he not only has to lie about what Spooner said, he has to lie about what capitalism even is. Then there's this next part. 
The following comment makes one wonder how Spooner would regard anarcho-capitalist protection firms. Any number of scoundrels, having money to start with, can establish themselves as a government because with money they can hire soldiers and with soldiers extort more money and also compel general obedience to their will. Here's what Spooner said immediately after that. It is with government, as Caesar said it was in war, that money and soldiers mutually supported each other, that with money he could hire soldiers and with soldiers extort money. So these villains, who call themselves governments, well understand that their power rests primarily upon money. With money they can hire soldiers, and with soldiers extort money. And when their authority is denied, the first use they always make of money is to hire soldiers to kill or subdue all who refuse them more money. For this reason, whoever desires liberty should understand these vital facts, viz. 1. That every man who puts money into the hands of a government, so-called, puts into his hands a sword which will be used against him, to extort more money from him, and also to keep him in subjection to its arbitrary will. 2. That those who will take his money without his consent in the first place will use it for further robbery and enslavement if he presumes to resist their demands in the future. 3. That it is a perfect absurdity to suppose that any body of men would ever take a man's money without his consent for any such object as they would profess to take it for, viz. that of protecting him. For why should they wish to protect him if he does not wish them to do so? To suppose that they would do so is just as absurd as it would be to suppose that they would take his money without his consent for the purpose of buying food or clothing for him when he did not want it. 4. If a man wants protection, he is competent to make his own bargains for it, and nobody has any occasion to rob him in order to protect him against his will. 5. That the only security men can have for their political liberty consists in their keeping their money in their own pockets until they have assurances perfectly satisfactory to themselves that it will be used as they wish it to be used for their benefit and not for their injury. 6. That no government so-called can reasonably be trusted for a moment or reasonably be supposed to have honest purposes in view any longer than it depends wholly on voluntary support. So he's only talking about it being a problem with scoundrels who can take the money by force. But McSorza lies and pretends it's about anarcho-capitalist protection firms, even though he specifically said if a man wants protection, he is competent to make his own bargains for it. And until they have assurances perfectly satisfactory to themselves that it will be used as they wish it to be used for their benefit and not for their injury. But that's exactly how anarcho-capitalist protection forms work. Spooner throughout his writings takes the side of the anarcho-capitalist over that of the socialist. For example, he explicitly supported private property in natural law. These conditions are simply these. These, first, that each man shall do towards every other all that justice requires him to do, as, for example, that he shall pay his debts, that he shall return borrowed or stolen property to its owner, and that he shall make reparation for any injury he may have done to the person or property of another. The second condition is that each man shall abstain from doing to another anything which justice forbids him to do, as, for example, that he shall abstain from committing theft, robbery, arson, murder, or any other crime against the person or property of another. So long as these conditions are fulfilled, men are at peace and ought to remain at peace with each other. He believed in free competition among businesses, as he showed with actions far better than anyone could with words when he started the American Letter Mail Company to compete with the U.S. Post Office. As far as the bedrock of socialism, which is welfare taken from those of means to give to the needy, he wrote, Man, no doubt, owes many other moral duties to his fellow man, such as to feed the hungry, clothe the naked, shelter the homeless, care for the sick, protect the defenseless, assist the weak, and enlighten the ignorant. But these are simply moral duties of which each man must be his own judge in each particular case as to whether and how and how far he can or will perform them. Spooner absolutely believed in the non-aggression principle, the bedrock of anarcho-capitalism. Ian McSorsa showed no compunction about quote mining and fabricating his way through Spooner's works, distorting and twisting them to say what he wanted them to say. But if Spooner really did believe that, why all the quote mining? 
McSorza deliberately picked these out to make it appear that Spooner was saying something other than what he explicitly and clearly said. The entirety of this article is a lie. But what isn't a lie is how much time and effort goes into making these videos. So if you like it, please hit like and subscribe and share this video far and wide. And please consider donating using one of the links below or becoming a regular supporter on Patreon or whatever other site I manage to set up recurring payments with. Until next time, stay strong and be free.